Jesus is not very nice. Today's gospel, Jesus says that some people don't go to heaven. It's not very nice. In fact, Jesus says that the rich and the wealthy don't go to heaven. We don't read this gospel passage very often at funerals. There's a reason for that. But it is God's word, so it's true. So how do we understand this? How do we deal with this? Well, let's first break it down. A young man comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to go to heaven. People do this to me all the time. I want to go to heaven. So Jesus greets the young man. He says, okay, let's start with the commandments. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal. The young man's like, fantastic. I don't do any of that. I fulfill all the laws. I fulfill all the laws. But let's not forget that Jesus didn't come to have people fulfill laws. That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about fulfilling laws. What's the New Testament about? Going above and beyond the laws. But the laws are only needed where we don't love. That God gives us love to fulfill the law. The laws are still valid. But his love is supposed to have us fulfill the law. So, the old adage is this, we only need laws where we don't love. We only need laws where we don't love. Repeat that with me. We only need laws where we don't love. Raise your hand if you're married. Do you need the law? Thou shall not kill thy wife. Do you need the law? Thou shall not kill thy husband. Only if you don't love. And sometimes, thanks be to God, we have the law. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have children. Do you need the law? Thou shall not kill thy child. <laughs> no, because you love them. But if you don't love them, do you need the law? You do. And thanks be to God for the law. Do you need the law? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Only if you don't love. As a young child, I needed the law. Thou shalt eat vegetables. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't love vegetables. Now I do. I actually, I love vegetables. I really do. Like, I don't need the law. Thou shalt eat healthy. I actually love eating healthy. But at one point, I needed the law. So Jesus looks at the young man, and he's like, fulfill the law. And the, the young man says, I, I do. And he's, he's like, I do. But then Jesus looks at him with love. And that's the key. That's the key. Jesus looks at him with love. Not to condemn him. To invite him. To invite him to what? To not just fulfill laws, but to love. So he looks at him and he says, sell all that you have and give your money to the poor and then come follow me. What's he asking the young man? Don't just fulfill laws. Love me. Radically love me. Realize that everything you have is mine and love me. Follow me. Be one with me. And this is where the young man, who had just been loved by Jesus, Jesus looked at him with love, and the young man walks away. We as Catholics are not called to fulfill laws, we're called to love. But Jesus knows that at the heart of it, when we start to fulfill laws, and thanks be to God, you're fulfilling the law this weekend. What, what law are you fulfilling at this very moment? Third commandment, right? Keep holy the Sabbath. Awesome. But Jesus wants not just the law. He wants your entire heart. And so he looks at the man and he says, he knows exactly where the man doesn't love. And he knows that he loves his possessions and money and wealth and the things of this world more than he loves Jesus himself. 
The reality is, is this is often the case for us as well, is it not? It's stewardship month. October always has lots of things. It's pro-life month. We have our spiritually adopted babies that we've been praying for for the past nine months. We'll celebrate their birth in just two weeks' time. It's Respect Life Month. It's the month of the rosary. But it's also stewardship month where we look at what do we do with the blessings that God has given to us. So, altar boys, come on out. Uh, Oleg, who else is inside there? Uh, come out and come down. Here we go. I have three things this morning. One is my checkbook. Two is a box of my shoes. And three is my will. I want to talk about what our gospel is getting at the heart of. And that's the fact that we are called to love God above all of our possessions. We are called to love God more than our wealth, more than everything we have, everything we own. I want to use these three little symbols to talk about this. So let's start with checkbook. About a year and a half ago when I arrived here at All Saints Parish, we talked about checkbooks. And I talked and said that it's very, very clear. I will challenge any of you to try to find somewhere in the Bible an argument against the fact that we are supposed to be giving 10% of our income to the Lord. That is the law. The law is, the Old Testament law is that we are called to give 10% of our income to the Lord. You can't argue with that. The struggle is the fact that Jesus came to fulfill the law. So in fact, today's gospel passage actually blows that out of the water. So the bare minimum is I give 10% of my earnings to the Lord. Jesus says, actually, you should be giving more than that. The whole idea of stewardship is that it's supposed to be sacrificial giving, not just 10%, because for some of you, 10% may be easy. 10% may be nothing. And thus, we're supposed to sacrificially give and give above and beyond that. Now, as I said a year and a half ago, when we talk about tithing, if you can't tithe, because if you tithed today, you would be calling me tomorrow to pay for your rent, then please don't tithe today. We believe in a law of gradualness, that we gradually have to bring ourselves to where God wants us. But if you don't have it as a goal of yours to be giving 10% of your income to the Lord, we got a problem. And that's a problem. And don't turn away and walk away as the young man did. But face the Lord in love and enter into that struggle. The reality is this, and this is what is always good to remember about checkbooks and banking accounts and saving accounts, it's not mine. This is not mine. This is how I always like to remember it. Raise your hand if you were taught with the Baltimore Catechism, which means you're old and awesome. <laughs> Those of us who were not, and I wasn't, the great gift of the Baltimore Catechism is that everybody knew the same stuff. There's really awesome things happening in the catechetical movement, really. Our catechetical program here, it's awesome. So, but there was something very cool about a universal program that every single American Catholic knew. So for example, I'm going to ask the question from the Baltimore Catechism, and you're going to respond, boys and girls, and I'll give you a holy card if you get it right. Um, why, did God made you, why did God make you? God made me to... Love and serve God. To know, love, and serve God. So why do you exist? You exist to what? No love and serve God. What does this exist for? <laughs> if you can't make that connection, we got a problem. Why do you exist? To know, love, and serve God. This is part of your life, so what does this exist for? To know, love, and serve God. But it's mine! No, it's not. But I earned it. No, you didn't. But I worked for it. No, you didn't. God gave you the ability to work. God gave you your, your gifts and your talents and your abilities. God gave you your job. 
God gave you everything. Nothing is yours because you exist to know, love, and serve God. And thus, this isn't even my checkbook. It's not my money. It's God's money. And not just because I'm a priest. The saint, that's for everybody. This isn't mine. The question is, what do I do with what God has given to me? The Lord says, at least, out of gratitude, give me 10%. You give the waitresses more than that at Denny's. And you don't give me, average Catholic, around 2%. And the Lord says, at a bare minimum, 10 So, where are we at in relationship with this? Where are we at with relation with the blessings that God has given to us? Because they're all blessings and they're all good, but they're not ours. They're the Lord's. Second of all, that's the checkbook. This is a shoebox. Mr. Oleg, what's in here? Running shoes. Are they used or new? <laughs> that's right, they're used. I went through my house. I went through my house. <coughs> I have five pairs of running shoes. How many pairs of feet do I have? Two. I have two feet, that's it. I have five running shoes. One of the early church fathers said that an extra cloak in your closet is stealing from the poor. Think about what we as Americans have. We hoard like it's nobody's business. Now, why do I have five pairs of running shoes and I have only two feet? Well, because like, well, I could use them again, you know, like, or like what happens if like my one pair of shoes like gets dirty or like gets wet? Now, I can justify the fact that I need to have two pairs of running shoes because literally sometimes they get wet and they have like this rot stuff and you have to like bleach them and get them clean. But the reality is this, I can go to downtown Indianapolis right now. I know exactly where to go. And there are people who are shoeless. And I am holding their shoes right here. And these are not my shoes, these are God's shoes. And I'm hoarding them for myself. And his children have no shoes right now. And there's something terribly wrong with that. The same is true with our clothes, our other possessions. They are not ours. These are not my shoes, they're God's shoes. And yet I hold on to them like they are mine. Raise your hand if you've ever had to help empty a house after someone dies. It's not fun, is it? And what do we ask ourselves as we're going through all of the stuff that they've hoarded? Why on earth would anyone keep all this stuff? And yet we often don't look in our own homes and realize that we do the exact same. I spent a week of my life in the Bronx with a group of Franciscan friars. This is before I was ordained a priest. I was actually thinking of joining the community. And they're pretty radical. They sleep on the floor. They don't, they don't have beds at all. They shave their heads and they have long beards. I, have, like, I wear my black cassock. They wear a gray Franciscan habit and they only have one. So they kind of stink a little bit. <laughs> but they try to live an extreme life of poverty and it, it genuinely is inspiring and awesome. I remember joining uh, them for that week and I remember talking to one of them. I was like, gosh, this is just so awesome. You guys are like poor and you're serving the poor and preaching the gospel. And one of them looked at me and he said, we're not poor. I said, what do you mean? You guys like sleep on the floor. You only have one gray habit. He said, Father, people give us stuff and God gives us so much stuff. He said, we actually now have it as a part of our community life that four times a year we have to go through our friary and empty out all the stuff that people give to us. Four times a year. They actually call it their poverty check. I'm vowing this week to do a poverty check on my rectory. I do it on a regu not as regularly as I should, but I try to do it. Because I have five pairs of shoes, which is ridiculous. In today's gospel... The young man is told by Jesus, take your possessions and sell them and give the money to the poor. Now, if you want to have a rummage sale, you can. To me, that's a lot of work when we could just give it directly to the poor. The North Dearborn Food Pantry, they'll take your clothes, they'll take your shoes. There are places all over that you can donate directly to the poor. 
So why don't we? Because we're scared. Because it's mine. Because I don't want to give. What did the man in today's gospel do? He closed in on himself instead of offering, instead of giving, instead of being free. Jesus looked at him with love, not with condemnation, with love, and invited him to give. He does the exact same thing to you and to me. Checkbook, shoes, and my will. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis requires all priests to have wills, often because we die with no children and we have stuff and they don't know what to do with it because we don't have kids to, I guess, take care of us. So, I was required to write a will. I haven't turned into the Archdiocese yet because it's not done. Um, so I tell people all the time that like, if I die, my will is on my desk, just look for it, you'll find it. So I, have, like, I, like, I sat down with a lawyer and writ, writ, but then I like, came up with other things that I wanted to do and so I changed stuff and whatever else. I want to talk about wills for a little bit. This is the last act that you will ever do. In fact, the act of your last breath, which is an action, brings this about. And I would like to say, what does this say? What does your will say about today's gospel? Does your will speak of God? Now, I will just tell you that the average norm is that we give our money to our children. That's like what we do. That's like the norm. I beg of you to go home tonight or this afternoon and read Psalm 17. Memorize that. Remember, we studied Matthew 16 a few weeks ago. Psalm 17. Psalm 17 says that the wicked give their money to their children. The wicked give their money to their children. Once again, we don't ever talk about wills in church. I think that we should. I've been dying for like years to actually talk about wills in church. Like, this is awesome. Um, what, what, what's the Bible getting at? Our gospel passage today. Now, I personally think of my parents who are actually here today, which is so awesome. Like, mom and dad, I don't want to be a part of your will. Like, if you really think about how, how weird it is, like, so my parents gave me birth, fed me, wiped my butt, cared for me when I was sick, clothed me, put me in a house, took me to school, cared for me my whole entire life, and then, like, I, as an adult, I'm supposed to think that my parents, when they kick the bucket, are going to, like, give me everything they have? It's, a, it's, it's really a screwed up understanding of parenthood because what it says is that parents never can give enough. My parents have given me more than I could ever deserve. I don't deserve what they've given me. And for me to think that when they die I'm supposed to get more? To do what with? Often to cause a lot of division. Raise your hand if, you've lived in a, if you live in a family or you know a family that because of inheritance money has major division in it. I hear about it in the confessional all the time. I hear about it in my office all the time. I have two questions to ask. Number one, why are we dying with money? Why aren't we giving it away while we're alive? That's grace. And number two, why are we giving it to our children? Now, I'm not, if you have children with special needs and children that have... My, my will actually has me giving some of my money to my, my godchildren if I die before they're out of college. Because I've made a commitment with my sister to, to help pay for their Catholic education because I want them to have a Catholic education. But why on earth are we giving more wealth to people who don't need it and normally just causes damage? Now, there is no official church teaching on this. I'm just asking the question. But go home and read Psalm 17. That's part of the church. And ask ourselves, what are we doing? And what does this really all mean? And why has God given me what he's giving me? And what do I do with it while I'm alive and when I die? Now, I'm not saying you need to give it all to All Saints Church. You could also will some of your money to me. I'm not your son or your daughter, but I mean... But you can give it to a homeless shelter. You can will it to... But what are we doing? And why has God given us what he's given us? For us to hold on to it or for him to look at us with love 
and us to give. God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him. He gave us laws not to hold us down, but that we might excel above out of love. When we encounter the Lord in love, we give. When we encounter the Lord in love, we give. This is the message of today's gospel. It's not about laws, it's about love. It's not about a God who asks for what is ours. It's about a God who asks of us to be one with him in what he has given us in the first place. It's his, it's not ours. Out of love, he looks at us today and says, follow me. Out of love, he looks at us today and he says, Offer what you have to those who are in need. Let's pray that we, out of love, will look back at him and act. May our checkbooks, our closets, our homes, and our wills reflect who we are as Christians, as people of love, as people of gift, as people of surrender. Not people who cling, not people who hold, not people who possess. May that be the message that the Lord speaks into our hearts and our ears today and the message that we act upon every day of our life. Amen.